Hi, I'm Leonard Paterenga. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's new in Systemd in 2018. Um, this talk is, mm, like, is basically just a collection of a couple of uh, um, things that uh, I found interesting in the development of Systemd in the last year, basically since the last um, uh, All Systems Go. Uh, there is no particular order, uh, no particular order, and that's completely fine if we don't cover everything that I have on the slides here. Um, so if you have any questions regarding any of the topics I'm bringing up here, by all means, do interrupt me and ask questions right away. I very much prefer if we can make this interactive than just do the questions at the end. That said, I only got half an hour, so uh, uh, I probably should get started. So, um, yeah, as mentioned, in no particular order. Um, the first thing is portable services. I'm not going to talk much about this because I actually got another talk um, later today in like an hour or something uh, just about that. But uh, it is a biggie, um, so I put this first. Um, what I actually do want to talk about is boot counting. Um, this is something that uh, um, it's not merged yet, but it's pending and like it's a PR and, and systemd and we're probably going to uh, have that uh, with the next release. Uh, boot counting is something like if you build um, operating systems that shall be somewhat um, like res re resilient to failure and that can actually recover automatically from uh, uh, failed boots, you need something like boot counting, meaning that uh, um, uh, the bootloader needs to somehow know if an update um, was successful and if it wasn't, revert back to the old version of the operating system. There are various operating systems that implement something like this. Um, for example, Chrome OS does, and so does uh, the real core OS. Um, but uh, most of the general purpose distributions have nothing like this, and all the solutions for this so far have been like local solutions for the specific um, operating systems. Nobody tried to make this a commodity, tried to make this generic so that it's um, generally useful by um, general purpose Linux distributions. Um, with this features thing in, is set in a systemd, we uh, want to generalize the general concepts around it as well as one specific implementation around one bootloader, the one that we ship ourselves, as boot, um, but everything that this entails is actually generic enough so that it can hook it up to other bootloaders, and there has been work to make that work with Grub as well. Um, how this actually ultimately um, will be noticeable to users is that when boot counting is enabled, um, the bootloader will um, boot one version of the operating system or of the kernel, will boot it up, and then uh, some tests can run after the kernel um, was booted up and figure out if everything's OK. And only when these tests parse, um, the um, boot menu item will be blessed. And if it's blessed, then the next time it's going to be um, booted again. If it's not blessed, um, uh, a counter was decreased, and it's decreasing from 3 or something to 0. And when it reached 0, then uh, it will not be attempted again to boot this. So uh, if you do uh, high reliability server stuff, if you do embedded stuff, that's interesting to you. If you do desktop stuff, it's probably not so interesting to you because if there's a human person sitting in front of the computer, this is not so interesting. Um, but uh, for everything else, it is. There was a question somewhere. Um, do we do the microphone? Or I can repeat the questions if that's quicker. to revert on the next boot. OK, so the question was regarding uh, what happens with uh, failures regarding, for example, video drivers that usually require a user to identify if everything's OK. Um, that's actually it's a good point. Like the Fedora people, like one of the Fedora people, Hans de Hude, has come up with exactly that issue. They want for the desktop stuff uh, something where only after GNOME Shell has been booted up and like the desktop environment figured out that everything's OK as well, that only then a particular kernel that was booted um, is blessed. Um, we currently do not, like this PR that is ready, like almost ready to merge, does not have that functionality yet. But we are, um, like, the, the, most of the concepts, the general ones, are extensible to that point. And we, it's very likely that before we do the next release, we'll also add that functionality so that this can be used in Fedora right away. Um, okay, let's talk about the next one. Uh, something that is also um, pending as a PR is, uh, you know, Nspawn is like this um, small container manager, manager that is inside of system needs like Cheroots on, on uh, steroids. Um, it's what we wrote to test system needs with. Um, it's actually generally useful now. Um, I have added uh, OCI runtime support. You know, OCI is a specification that came out of the Docker container stuff that's supposed to generically define how uh, containers are supposed to look like. Um, 
Uh, Nspawn pretty much implemented everything needed to do OCI stuff, except that it didn't implement OCI <laughs> itself. Um, so given that it looks like maybe, hopefully, people can agree that OCI is the way how containers are put together, um, it made sense for us to support that in N Nspawn natively. So um, yeah, the idea is basically that then the, with the basic building blocks of the operating system, you can just run your containers like as the executor. This is not going to solve um, like how the containers actually got onto the system. That's um, for other people to solve. But um, I think the long-term uh, goal would, that would be actually useful to have is that Kubernetes could just use that thing directly so that the actual execution of the container is no longer something that people have to think about in the upper layer, but the execution of the container is actually just the functionality of the operating itself as long as it's an OCI container. Um, so this is also pretty much ready and just needs to be uh, finally reviewed and be merged into systemd. And hopefully then just works for everybody. But then again, initially, I mean, I tested with a couple of OCI containers, but before this will end up in the, in the uh, big distributions, it will probably require more testing for real life containers. Um, any questions to that otherwise? Next one. This one is an interesting one. Um, this is already in systemd. Um, uh, like, um, if you follow systemd development, you, notice, you might have noticed that we um, uh, try to put a lot of focus nowadays on sandboxing of system services, right? Like, the idea being that um, most operating systems are still put together mostly out of system services, and um, if we add um, sandboxing to those, we can generally make operating systems a lot more secure because uh, we have so many different services and they tend to be imperfectly written because they're written by humans. Um, yeah, so system call uh, uh, filters have been implemented in systemd for a while, but they were not overly useful because you w had to figure out exactly um, the system calls you wanted to allow and the system calls you didn't want to allow. With, uh, and it was mostly blacklist system, so you basically told um, systemd to not allow Apache to change the clock. Um, in general, though, um, if you do security, you usually prefer whitelisting systems where you, instead of saying that Apache is not allowed to do uh, clock, you just list what it is allowed to do. Um, this is not easy to do, though, because there are so many s uh, system calls. Since the latest release, we have this system call group. It's called Ad System Service, which we sat down and tried to figure out what's a good set of system calls to, by default, allow regular system services, right? Like, which is the the basic set of system calls that everybody needs. And then we gave that a name. And the idea is that basically from now on, people who put together system services will just enable this group, plus a couple of individual system calls they need that are not in this group, which is, for example, the right to change um, the system clock. But other than that, yeah. So the idea is really we want to push people to do whitelisting of system calls by default and make that more easy than it uh, used to be. Questions regarding that? Otherwise, so the question was regarding which is the most controversial system call that is in there that we had to argue about. Mm, good question. Like, I mean, this doesn't this didn't come out of nothing. Like, we had these groups since a while, but these groups were all very like um, uh, small. Um, so, so it was not like you still had like previously you had to list a lot of these groups um, to actually run any regular service like for example Apache, right? Um, so after learning from that how this actually played out in real life and trying to look at generic services like for example Apache or Nginx which don't do anything magic, right? Like they do very basic stuff. There's nothing um, particularly kernel related that they do. Um, the idea is basically, yeah, this just contains everything that you need to run Nginx but not more, right? Like so it's not enough to run an NTP server because that needs to change the clock. It's not enough to run like a network management service because that needs to be able to change the network. But it is enough to run an HTTP server that just does basic file serving or something like this. But yeah, so there wasn't anything controversial. It's, it's um, like from uh, educated information like how things are. Um, no other questions, let's go to the next one. This one's actually kind of useful. It's a minor thing. It's, uh, you know, if you do service management with systemd, you always have to specify a type equals something um, to specify how the service tells systemd about when it's ready to, uh, with, with, when it finished initialization. Um, type exec is actually something we should have added a long time ago. Um, it's basically, um, <laughs> it's a, it's a um, hack so that systemd will consider a service ready in the moment that the exec VE 
that the kernel, like where, where systemd, um, when it uh, invokes the binary, calls the exec VE, and the moment the exec VE succeeded, that's when systemd considers the service to be successfully started up. This is sounds not surprising in its definition, but it is like the way Unix is built, not the obvious way how this is implemented. Previously, um, what came closest to this type was type equals simple, but in that case, systemd would um, consider a service started up in the instant that the fork completed, right? Like, and if you do are a Unix de um, developer, you do know that when you start a process, you first fork, and then the child you exec, and previously would think it was at the fork ready, and now we can optionally think that it's at the exec ready. Why is that interesting? It's interesting because it basically means that systemd will no longer consider a service whose binary is absent successful, um, uh, successfully started, because previously, when it reached the exec, it already thought it was started. If the binary wasn't there, the exec would fail, um, and the service startup would still be considered um, uh, uh, successful. So with this, uh, things are a little bit more debuggable, but then again, compatibility, we can't make this the new default, so you have to, if you want to use it, have to explicitly specify it. But it's incredibly useful and, quite frankly, something we should have in, um, in the, like, uh, had since always. So I don't think the mic works, so I'll repeat that. So the question is, why didn't we make it the new default? Why um, uh, we made this opt-in? The reason for this is that uh, uh, between, uh, between the um, fork and the exec, um, systemd executes a lot of operations, like dropping privileges and things uh, and so on. And there are a couple of these um, operations, like for example, for the dropping of the privileges, you need to resolve a username. Resolving a username um, might need NSS, might need IPC to another service, and so you suddenly create races because suddenly something is blocking, like systemd PID1 will block on an S lookup before it starts other services that it previously didn't, right? So it's just the risk of deadlocks um, that we saw there, so we couldn't make the default because, yeah. We didn't actually try if we change it, if it boots still, but it's just knowledge of that NSS is a major source of deadlocks. We couldn't switch this. I hope you guys followed in any way what we were discussing there. Um, DNS over TLS, you know, uh, system has this resolve D component that does um, like a local DNS caching um, server. Um, recent addition is uh, DNS that's merged and released even um, is to add DNS over TLS. Um, the logic behind that is that um, uh, it appears to be the way how the DNS is going to work um, in the next uh, uh, 10 years is that everybody does this. This does basically just transport encryption, but um, the way DNS uh, TLS works is that you do a TCP connection always to a central server, and um, if you do that, you always need um, like a local caching uh, singleton service that actually does that because you, it becomes too expensive if every process um, would always do the uh, TCP and uh, TLS connection itself because there would a huge latency be um, involved. So this is actually, I think, a major step forward because it actually gives a lot of reason to use ResolveD because, uh, yeah, you start actually needing this if you want to um, work with the way how the DNS is going to work in the future, right? Simply because you don't want the latency and ResolveD um, can give you this ability that you cache it um, locally and uh, have the connection already in, in, in action so that you don't need to create it when you actually need it. Um, any questions about this? Um, this one looks a little bit cryptic. Um, so what the uh, system we recently learned is uh, um, uh, this, this is basically about um, service management when you write a unit file you already had this um, ability to extend a unit file by these drop-in files, right? So if you had foobar.service, you could create a directory foobar.service.d and drop in a, a file there called something.conf and then would be read after the service file itself and could override or extend what the service file did. We slightly extended this now. The extension is like we look not just for the service name .d and then everything um, uh, with a suffix conf in that directory, but we'll also look for all dash prefixes of the name. The idea basically being, if you have a service that's called foo-bar-valdo.service, then we'll first look in foo-bar-valdo.service.d, as before, but now we'll also look in foo-bar-service.d, uh, uh, um, and then all files in there, as well as foo dot 
service.d if you still follow. I, should, I probably should have put that on the slides, I guess. Um, <laughs> anyway, the, the long story short, a lot of people, when they uh, put together their systems, they usually have uh, a lot of servers that somewhat belong together, right? So, uh, I don't know, Samba, for example, comes with Samba and NMBD and so on. They, they are like uh, related services that um, are usually shipped together, run together, um, and that hence you might want to manage together. Um, with this change here, it basically a system it allows you to, as long as you follow a very simple naming scheme that you always um, uh, name these related services with um, something dash, some suffix, right, and that, that the prefix is always the same, you can extend all of the service file in one go because systemd now allows this prefix um, uh, um, extension. So, uh, did this make any sense to anyone here? Like, I know this is kind of, wow, surprisingly many. Who didn't, did not understand what I was just talking about? Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah, well, this is a little bit confusing. Just think that this is not there. So it's foo dash. Like, if you have a service called foo dash bar dash valdo dot service, then we would first look for foo dash bar dot valdo dot service to D. Then we would remove, the, remove everything after the last dash, right? After the last dash, so actually without this. Dash dot. Dash dot, yeah. Oh. Um, then we would remove everything after the slash before that, and so on. So the next thing would be this foo dash. Um, dot service, right? So the dash always has to be there because the dash implies that we will do this extension checking, right? It's a very natural extension, we believe, because at least in systemd itself, all our services already were named like this. And if you go through the Fedora package services, you will actually realize people implicitly did the same kind of thing, right? Like where they always used um, some common prefix, dash, some uh, specific suffix, right? So the idea is basically to make this a lot easier to, to uh, um, extend in one go. Yeah, then you. Yeah, I'm supposed to uh, repeat the question. So the question was regarding what happens if I create a directory called systemd dash after uh, dash uh, dot service dot d and drop something in. Yes, it will change every single s uh, service that we ship automatically for you in one go. I'm not sure if that's desirable, but knock yourself out. Um, uh, so, uh, next slide. This is super important. Um, uh, <laughs> it's like uh, we realized that uh, today's uh, graphical terminals all support a special ANSI sequence so that you actually can generate clickable hyperlinks in them. Uh, and that's just awesome. So uh, I like uh, recently um, prepared that PR and it got merged that uh, everywhere where it makes sense in systemd output, we now create clickable links in your terminal. And that is really, really nice because, uh, like, for example, if you do system control status now, um, you know how the current output looks like, like that it shows you the unit file that something's defined in and uh, like the, all the other the drop-ins and so on. These are now clickable links. So in the system control status output, you can just click on it now and it opens the edit or whatever you have configured to actually have a look on it. It's really nice. Um, so uh, I invite everybody to extend their, your own uh, uh, the tools that you work on was the same way because it's like, I mean, come on, links. It's, it's almost as good as emojis, right? Um, uh, only problem with this is while all the uh, current terminals do implement this, like the graphical terminals, less does not, right? Like the pager does not. Um, so if you use the pager, which we actually do by default because we do git style auto paging in most system tools, yeah, you're not going to see this. Um, so it's, that's a bit of a limitation. Um, but we hope that uh, less will upda be updated eventually to support this um, as well. And then uh, it's, so, it's going to be so much better. Um, any questions about that? No questions about that? Uh, something we recently did is uh, we turned on memory counting by default. Um, background of this is uh, this is basically how systemd exposes C groups, like the various controllers there are. Um, like, I mean, the C groups controllers allow you two things always accounting and resource management, right? Like figuring out how much resources does a service use and putting limits on how much it may use. Um, uh, there are multiple controllers. These controllers had, uh, um, like, different qualities in the kernel implementation, and some of them were really expensive. So until recently, if you turned on memory, the memory controller, 
for example, for to get memory accounting per service, they slowed down your machine by 10% or something, was the average that Tijun said. Um, we have recently turned this on by default um, because this has changed in the kernel. With current kernels, uh, the memory counting is, I mean, it's not going to be completely free, but it's very close to zero um, uh, for being free. So this was enough for us to say, OK, by default, it's up, uh, uh, enabled now. We also turned on block IO accounting and, uh, and uh, not CPU accounting, but uh, task accounting. So three of the really interesting ones are enabled by default. Effectively, what does that mean? It means that if you do type system control status on a, on a completely regular default system, you will now see how much memory a service uses, how much uh, um, processes it has. Unfortunately, not yet how much I.O. it used, but uh, that's just an omission because we were lazy, not because we didn't want to. I also heard that uh, from... Uh, the guy working on it that we probably very soon can enable IP accounting the same way by default because um, they managed uh, to um, make the cost for getting that information per service um, so low that uh, it's not like it's something we can enable by default. I'm totally looking forward to this because I think it makes service management lots more explorable because it will like, like you, you don't even have to do anything magic, it will just tell you out of the box um, how much resources it takes up. It's quite frankly something we should have always had but never had. Uh, what's interesting now, the CPU accounting is still too expensive. Um, that's very unfortunate. I think it would actually be the most interesting one, like how much um, CPU time actually service uses. So we're going to have to wait a little bit longer for that. But as soon as the kernel guys work on this, let me know that it's uh, safe now um, and it's not um, costs you 10% or what in CPU time. Just turning this on will enable that too. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, any questions regarding that? Something we also added is IP accounting and firewalling. This is like, I mean, we had CPU accounting and, and, and management, and we had um, uh, block I.O. and memory, as mentioned. We now also have that for IP packets. So if you turn this on, which, as mentioned, is not entirely free yet, but we want to, um, like, it's the current people are working on making it free, um, then the uh, uh, system will track per service how many packets have been received and have been sent by each uh, 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 service as well, how many bytes that is. Um, I think it's incredibly useful. Uh, there's also firewalling related to that, where you can basically specify IP address ranges that a service may contact or may not contact. Um, we turned the firewalling on for all our services that we ship by default, actually. Um, so exa for example, UDEF cannot access the network anymore, which is a really good thing, because UDEF shouldn't be able to access the network anymore. And we went through all our services, so this is enabled everywhere. I think this is, this is really an awesome feature, because it basically allows you to do really service-level firewalling, and it's fully dynamic, and it's, um, the, like, I mean, if you do traditional firewalling on Linux with IP tables or something like this, you do it at a level where you look at the individual packets um, that flow through the network, so you have no local context anymore. Like, the packets stand for themselves, you don't know really which program they belong to. With this new stuff um, that is resolved because you actually, this is inherently local, right? Like, all the accounting, all this um, uh, access um, control is inherently something you configure per service. Um, so, I think it's a massive step forward, and it is how local firewalling um, uh, should work. By the way, this is this guy who's doing the video implemented this part, so um, say thanks to Daniel. Um, I think I don't have much time anymore. Um, let's spend it with questions, if you have any. If nobody has a question. How is firewalling implemented? Uh, how is firewalling implemented? Do you use BPF for that? Yeah, the, 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 I use, uh, like we use um, uh, the, the, like the BPF per C group um, packet filter hooks that exist in current kernel. This functionality is only viable if you enable C groups v2, by the way, <laughs> which means that uh, I think it's, it should actually be one of the major reasons why distribution should really, really look into t uh, turning on C groups v2 now. Um, the container mess is kind of stopping us from that, but that's a really highly political discussion that is really messy. But uh, yeah, it's all BPF, and it's, um, if you want to experience this and how awesome this is, um, you have to make sure that you run a distribution that um, supports C groups v2. And uh, like Fedora, for example, you can specify that at the kernel command line. And it should just work then. There's another question. Um, do you also live support, support live reloading of rules and probably some API to change those on the fly while the service is still running? 
Yes, we do. Um, like this is exposed through all, uh, like the same way as all the other resource management uh, properties of systemd services. So you can do system control set property, uh, some service name, uh, IP accounting equals yes, and there you go. You have the IP accounting, but you can also do same thing, and then IP uh, address allow equals something. Okay. Um, and then um, you can even reset it like this, so it's, it's entirely dynamic, entirely focused on the specific service. But uh, the interesting thing is also that this is available as well for slices, right? So you can actually build entire trees of this. Um, and uh, the firewalls that you specify for a slice and the firewall that you specify for a service that is inside of a slice get merged. Right, um, so you can do something like you said for the root slice, no traffic is allowed, and then for a leaf slice, uh, for a sle leaf service, it shall be able to do traffic to this port, and then they get merged, and so the the um, uh, uh, blacklist at the top gets um, masked out by the whitelist at the bottom. So it's the behavior you want. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool, cool actually. Very cool. And it's all DBS APIs if you like that, and you can with shell you can do set property. But my time's probably over. One more time, one more questions? No more questions? Okay, if you have any further questions, then meet me in the hallway tracks. Thank you very much. <laughs>